Okay, it's about time. Let's get started. Hello, everyone. I hope you all are well and safe. Thank you for joining this webinar. It is the fourth ready webinar discussing pandemic related issues. Today, Professor Firos will discuss supply chain crisis management under this pandemic. Zar Firos has been teaching various courses, including business analytics, supply chain analytics, and operations here at Rady since last year. Before joining Rady, he had taught at USC Marshall as well as Harvard. Zal is actually uh, teaching this very issue of supply chain crisis management now, which we will talk, which he will talk about today. Uh, roughly, we will have about 20 minutes of presentations and 10 minutes of Q&A in the end. If you have any questions during his talk, please type your questions in the chat and I'll try to read as many questions as possible after his talk. With that, uh, I'll, the floor is all yours, Zar. Hit it. Thank you, Shin. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, uh, Kanishka and, and, uh, and Jill and everyone for having me um, for this session and uh, allowing me to speak. Uh, the title of the talk is going to be Supply Chain Insights and Modifications uh, in a Pandemic. And we're going to go through a few areas of just some presentation material that discusses what's happened, what's taking place now, some of the effects that we're seeing, and perhaps some methods for minimizing some of the disruption, perhaps what the outlook is uh, after everything's said and done and when we return to, you know, quote unquote normal and, and methods for how a supply chain might look um, in different ways. So based on that, this is just a quick agenda and a quick kind of summary of, of what the topics are that we're going to be focusing on uh, and how the, the, the talk is going to go. Uh, as Shin mentioned, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll answer questions. Uh, I, I usually prefer to, to answer the questions through the speed, through the talk, but since we've only got a limited amount of time, it actually makes it easier to, uh, to just pull the questions at the end, and then we'll we'll kind of go one by one and uh, and, and see where we where we stand and what uh, what insight we can kind of provide. So to start off with, um, it, it's interesting that we we continue to hear um, the the words unprecedented and, and you know these types of descriptions for for what's taking place, and indeed that is the case. From a supply chain perspective, things are interesting because there have been a number of events that have taken place. Over the past, you know, over 100 years, which have actually changed the way supply chains have functioned. Um, these are have also been unprecedented events in their own, you know, time, uh, and they've been unexpected events that have changed how global supply chains work. They've been somewhat expected events that have kind of just been a, a little bit of, of a collapse that have taken place over time. But inevitably, they've they've changed how business is is, is, is done. Now, the word supply chain disaster, crisis within supply chain, um, it's interesting because there are many different ways that we can kind of look at this. We can look at a crisis in a supply chain um, being a employee strike or a factory shutdown or, or something of the sort. And, and that would you know, impact an entire supply chain just as well as, as, a, as a natural disaster that would have hit. Um, perhaps what's different in, in this scenario is that COVID-19 has essentially affected every single industry in some way, shape, or form. If we look at you know, some of the past events that have taken place, and we look at 9-11 you know, in 2001, we can see that you know, tourism industry was hit, the airline industry was hit. There was a, a heightened level of security. You know, people were uh, afraid to fly. Uh, airlines were going bankrupt left and right. And that heightened security required you know, cargo transport to go through different security measures and all sorts of different ways of evaluating data to minimize the effect on lead time and these types of things actually took place, which, which actually changed the supply chain. When we went into 2008, we saw there was another global financial crisis or a global financial crisis that you know, impacted all sorts of areas from manufacturing to uh, US manufacturing to distribution. A number of different areas were impacted and all of a sudden we found that supply chains were, were, were changing a little bit. They were becoming a little bit more flexible in terms of distribution, they were collaborating a little bit more. It was a little bit more of a focus on uh, supplier relationship management. And then, you know, another um, event that took place, which was in 2011, the, the Thailand floods, uh, this was an interesting one because it impacted um, the hard drive um, manufacturing, if you will, uh, back in the day, and as well as, you know, the automotive market from Honda to Toyota to Nissan, uh, the global industrial production reduced by 2.5%. And all of a sudden, it was more of a focus on, on data-driven demand modeling uh, than, than perhaps previously. And now, all this is basically saying is that 
there have been supply chain disasters that have taken place in the past. Okay. This time around, here's what we're seeing. So in this COVID-19 era, um, what we're seeing is that we can actually evaluate how, what the gravity is of this situation and what the impact is from a number of different perspectives. We can actually see that it's not necessarily just impacting um, you know, manufacturing. Uh, because there's a plant or plants that have gone under or, or a natural disaster that's affected a particular region. It's not necessarily impacting, um, you know, consumer spending because, you know, there is a higher unemployment level. It's affecting the entire range. And if you think about the nature of a supply chain, um, it's essentially putting products together and the transport of products. And if you're missing one particular resource or one particular uh, material, that entire chain is essentially broken or vulnerable. Now, if we look at some of these numbers, we can see that from you know the beginning, we can kind of see how things are working. We can see the impact to consumers overall and how this might be changing consumer behavioral patterns, buying patterns. We can see that there's a, a, a GDP decline of 30.1% between April and June. Unemployment spikes of 14.7%. And that basically translates to job losses of 20.5 million. Now, this is very important right? because what this is basically you know meaning is that there is lowered consumer purchasing power. And what that means is that there's a lesser spending in terms of air travel, food delivery, public transport, restaurants, all of these different industries that would sometimes be affected individually, but now are being affected kind of across the board. If we look at the actual numbers in terms of job loss, we can actually see how it compares to the jobs that were actually gained. So from April 2011 to February 2020, the U.S. actually gained a, a, a lot of jobs, 21 million. Yet in April 2020, those jobs were essentially lost. So we can actually see the, the change that's taken place in terms of how consumers are actually impacted just from, from the, you know, the raw beginning of a supply chain. Look at unemployment numbers in comparison to other um, disasters that have taken place or travesties that have taken place. We can kind of see that you know, this COVID-19 situation and, and, and era has resulted so far in a 14.7% job loss, but our unemployment rate, I should say, if you compare this to the Great Depression, if you compare it to the Great Recession in the 2000s, we can actually see how, how you know, severe the loss of employment actually is. Now, looking at this doesn't necessarily paint a, a, a clear picture. This, this basically tells us that you know, behind the scenes, um, you know, consumers are losing their jobs. They're not necessarily having the same level of income that they're having. And this suggests that there could be uncertainty in the market. It suggests that people might not necessarily have as much disposable income. If we look at the actual data in terms of how people are spending, then we get a little bit more of a clear picture. Now we can see, you know, in the United States, we, we see how things are kind of moving percentage-wise. So there is still a demand to shop in grocery stores, uh, but physical stores have kind of gone, you know, screeched to a halt because they're not open. Shopping malls, the same type of thing, right? Negative 17%. Domestic travel, negative six. And we can kind of see a pattern beginning to emerge. It's not necessarily a clear picture that every single industry is affected equally. It's more so a situation that consumer behavioral patterns, which dictate purchasing and dictate how a supply chain actually functions from a demand perspective, are being hit right from core. If we look at other areas, we can see that there's governmental restrictions. There, there's no movie theaters that are open. There's no uh, sporting events that are, that, are, that are taking place. Um, and if we look at, you know, the fact that people are losing jobs, there's economic uncertainty. No one really knows when this is going to end, which means there's lots of conservative spending habits that are taking place. If we look at, you know, that's from the consumer side. Let's say we look all the way to the manufacturing side. The manufacturing side also has its own fair share of issues. Uh, Tyson Foods made the news recently because there were concerns about employees who may have contracted the coronavirus. Uh, if we look at certain types of products from the automotive sector that has been essentially shut down until recently in terms of actual manufacturing, you can see a huge you know, fall in terms of the numbers of people who are actually buying new cars. And the justification for that is that you, you can't buy a new car even if you wanted to. Used cars, et cetera, all of these different businesses are subject to the same rules and restrictions and guidelines, governmental guidelines, that prevent certain entities from being open, and it's differing by you know, state to state, country to country. If we look on the, on the flip side, um, one of the, uh, the speakers in the class that I am teaching this quarter um, is, uh, is a soap manufacturer, and they were talking about you know, the, the, the PPE industry, the, the protected industry, uh, and how this industry has actually gone up in terms of more people are wanting to buy hand sanitizer. Remember, 
uh, a few weeks ago, if you walked into a CVS or a Walgreens, you couldn't find hand sanitizer. You couldn't find uh, Lysol wipes. You know, these types of things are now in extremely high demand. This doesn't necessarily mean for a supply chain that this is great news. This means that it's you know entering more demand uncertainty into the mix. And if we look on the back end, we can actually see that Chinese manufacturing, we're looking at actual numerical data, has seen a 13.5% decline in January and February of 2020 versus January and February of 2019. Now, this is Chinese manufacturing, right? Let's take a look and see what happens if we look at the U.S. manufacturing. We actually see that there's a similar situation that's taking place. The output in terms of U.S. manufacturing is actually down to the same level, very close to, that it was when we were in the Great Recession. It's called the Great Recession, right? That's, you know, the word that seems to be gaining more popularity now and uh, since we're in COVID. So in 2009, we can see that the manufacturing levels were pretty low, and now it seems like we're kind of at that same level in terms of what the output is from U.S. manufacturing. This, these are the numbers that, that just came out today. Um, going a step further, we can also see how people are adapting to these changes. Now, this is obvious, right? We can see that people are going towards online shopping. And, and as a result, there's less of a reliance on retail markets. And so we can see that there's more online shopping. Um, the, this acronym over here, B-O-P-I-S, means uh, buy online and pick up in store. We can see that that's also kind of moving up. We can see that in general, there seems to be a switch. And this is easy to understand and easy to to recognize a switch towards people shopping online. And not necessarily only shopping online, but shopping online, purchasing online, and then going and picking up the item in the store. Even though there are certain retailers that are still available, like grocery stores and these types of things, which you know have, have not shut down necessarily in all regions, we're still seeing a push from consumers to actually try and avoid those types of, of entities. And that's not necessarily unexpected. These are government you know, suggestions. These are, this is the news media and these are the suggestions to stay home. You possibly can. So with that type of push, we're seeing changes in terms of consumer behavior patterns. Huge changes in fact. 210% spike in terms of online orders at grocery merchants between 2019 and 2020. So these are some of the numbers in terms of how people are, are changing. But let's look a little bit more at what industries are so if we look at the probability of, of, of companies defaulting within particular industries, we can actually see that you know, there's a lot of industries that are actually at the tipping point where with the, with the slowdown and with every, you know, all the adjustments that have been made, a lot of companies are, or a lot of industries are feeling a, a significant effect. If we chart this, instead of looking at it on a, on a grid, we can actually see how this looks. And again, this information is maybe charted so you can see it and appreciate it, but not necessarily unexpected and certainly not a shock. You can see airlines at the top. You can see, you know, that there's a, a push overall with every single industry suffering. Now, to my earlier point, what we're also seeing is that if we look at, you know, industries that have been least impacted, we can also see that irrespective if they've been least impacted or most impacted, they're still impacted in terms of what's actually taken place in the last few weeks. And we look at, um, you know, the industries that we know of, the airline industry, which has taken a huge hit, uh, the gambling casino and, 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 and the the casino industry and the gambling industry, which has taken an enormous hit with Las Vegas as a whole being shut down and every other casino not being accessible, and, you know, these types of things. But we can also look at leisure facilities, auto parts, oil and drilling, everything is taking its own share of, of a hit. Now, going down this path, we should probably be focusing a little bit more, not necessarily on what's happened. There's plenty of data that suggests how consumers have been impacted, how businesses have been impacted industries. What we perhaps should be looking at is how to minimize this disruption. Um, so it's taking place right now, we know that it is. But how do we minimize this disruption in, in general? From a supply chain perspective, this is an interesting type of analogy. The reason for why is because there's no end in sight. If, if there was a earthquake or if this was a hurricane, we'd know that it would take this much time to get back on track. We'd know that it would take this much time for everything to kind of resurface, for them to get funding, etc. We still don't have an end date in sight, which means that what is taking place and what should be taking place is and a focus on reducing risk and, and reducing exposure. What this means from a supply chain perspective is perhaps the adjustment of production uh, based on short-term demand projection, not necessarily long-term. It was always, uh, if you ever look at a supply chain, you ever look at a production facility or, or production company, whether it be CPG or automotive, there's always forecasts for the year, for the month, for the quarter, for all these different periods, uh, based on historical data, based on modeling, based on simulation. But now everything's changed. 
Now, no one necessarily knows what's going to happen next. And you can't necessarily use last year's data to predict what's going to happen in the future. You can't necessarily use data from a recession to predict. So in that respect, an adjustment of production based on short-term demand projection is ideal, is the only way to kind of move forward. Furthermore, sourcing of resources is, uh, is, is a hot topic as well. If you look at how things have transcri- transpired over the last five weeks, uh, companies haven't been able to get resources from certain countries because of FDA regulations, because of uh, governmental restrictions, because of shipping restrictions, because of a shortage in terms of you know, all sorts of different ways. Even if the product is available, it's not necessarily accessible. It can't be transported from a country like China, which is handling all sorts of production, to a country like the United States, where there's all sorts of demand. What this might mean is that an alternative sourcing of resources might be next, and a more localized supply chain might come into perspective. And this also might mean alternative production and storage and distribution habits, right? So how exactly these products are distributed. Is it a situation in which less product needs to be stored offshore, more product needs to be stored in the actual country? Is it a situation in which shorter distribution cycles need to be focused on so that there is a attention placed on direct to consumer delivery. We're seeing this already with um, the, the heightened uh, you know, online orders where there has to be delivery to the actual consumer's door, right? as opposed to a reliance on, on traditional retail outlets. Even if those traditional retail outlets are still functioning, there's more of a tension that's being put to actually getting a product to the person's door, not necessarily getting it to the store in which you can buy it. Now, if we continue on here, we can kind of see that this basically means that there needs to be flexibility from the perspective of business. They need to actually have that flexibility in terms of fulfillment, how they're going to distribute these products. Uh, If they're going to distribute them online, what's the timelines for this? Are they still able to make those two-day timelines? We look back in a a yesteryear, you know, in, in... around the year 2000, when online shopping was, was becoming more and more popular, there were a couple of concerns. Accessibility, uh, security, um, the time it would take for a product to come, the price. All of these issues are now back once again. They're just back in a different way because now it's not necessarily security of the credit card. It's more so um, concerns in terms of health. As far as how businesses are operating in general, some of the suggestions and some of the research suggests that, that now is a time for renegotiating of existing contracts and agreements that are taking place within the supply chain, between the supplier and the manufacturer, the distributor, the warehouse. The, and the reason for why is because there are terms in certain contracts called force majeure terms, which are acts of God, which, which potentially dictate that a contract can be changed or it can be voided. And the reason for this is because there is a need to push towards the conservation of cash. We're seeing this overall. We're seeing a lower number, you know, amount of spending in terms of consumerism. We're seeing this kind of taking place. In addition to that, there's also opportunities for businesses to actually lock in at lower price prices and renegotiate contracts. Um, whenever oil prices drop, uh, the entire cost structure changes. Think about the cost of distribution. Think about the cost of storage. Think about the economies of scale and comparing exactly how many truckloads you'd want to come in versus how much you'd actually want to store. Now all the numbers are completely different because that transport is now priced completely different. Um, Again, with the adjustment of agreements and relationships, here is a perfect opportunity for companies to now reset those supplier relationships, reset the procurement policies. And all of this is, again, focusing on smaller demand cycles, smaller projection, understanding exactly where you know, there, there's potential to reduce commitment and, and lower risk. If we go a step further, we can also see that this change, this, because of COVID-19, we're inevitably going to see things move differently. It's inevitable if we look at you know 9/11, if we look at the floods, things have changed, and and things will inevitably change here. And if you think about how business has gone in the last five years, where there's been a tremendous transition to online purchasing, that's likely to continue at least to a percentage. People are not necessarily going to you know, go back to the store when they now know that they can buy online efficiently and and have relied on it for the past couple of weeks. Uh, there might be more of a reliance on consumer distribution. So how we look at last mile delivery, how we look at third party vendors who are actually distributing products. The supply chains as a whole would change. There might be more of a focus on localized supply chain. So regional sourcing, uh, instead of um, you know, you know, bringing produce from different countries, um, which may now take longer because of security threats or because of, of health risks, um, now sourcing those that produce in-house or in the country or in its specific region. This might actually bring up employment in certain areas, but at the same time, it might actually bring up cost. 
What we're seeing now is that there might also be a reliance on third-party distribution outlets. If we have more demand that's taking place for in-house product, in-house distribution, in-house manufacturing, we might need to see more distribution in terms of how we get those products to the last to 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 the actual consumer. It's no longer a situation in which we are always going to go to a retailer. That traditional supply chain is essentially broken. And in doing this and in discussing all of these different areas, what we're essentially saying is that we are moving away from the concept of globalization, which has been in effect a mainstay for the last however many years, however many decades. And we've been growing and growing and growing, where we have manufacturing in one country, distribution in another, all these types of uh, different pieces. In addition to this, we're going to see heightened manufacturing, distribution, warehouse, delivery, health data. This is kind of a common one. Right? We're, we're going to see screening at production points. We're going to see screening at distribution points. This is more so something that's almost inevitable um, in, in certain ways, simply because this is almost an expectation of how we are now kind of moving towards. Even if you look at consumerism in terms of grocery stores, there's still that check, but only that a certain amount of people and you have to wear them. This is going to take place in a, in a higher level in terms of manufacturing, distributing, warehousing, and everything of the sort within a supply chain, most likely. Again, with the shorter supply chains, we're going to see this re reliance on these third-party distribution options. And we're also going to see um, the potential for higher costs, because if we are producing in countries like the United States, manufacturing in countries like Canada, or you know, where we don't necessarily need to rely on the distribution, all of a sudden we might not necessarily be able to take advantage of the benefits that we had before. We might not necessarily be able to take advantage of lower employment costs or or, or tax breaks, or, you know, these types of things, which could potentially actually push prices, consumer products. Back. Um, looking at this. If we look at how the modification is taking place, we can kind of see that overall, it's not necessarily a situation in which there is just one modification that needs to take place in one sector of this budget. It's kind of throughout, right? You can see differences in terms of consumer behavior, we can see differences in terms of manufacturing, differences in terms of distribution, storage, warehousing, differences in terms of what the supply chain looks like overall, because it's now gonna be a focus towards actually getting it into the hands of consumers as opposed to getting it into a retail space that's close enough. And in general, what this might mean is that in in, in, in light of the fact that there's unemployment numbers and we need to you know, increase this, and the entire relationship that a supply chain has within business is likely to change. Okay, so I I was I was told to keep the talk to 20 minutes. I rushed through a little bit of it. I'm, I'm so sorry. Just to, to kind of you know uh, uh, close off the the, the presentation. Um, this semester, uh, sorry, this quarter, uh, the the course that I was uh, teaching, that I am teaching, uh, that, that Shin had mentioned at the beginning, uh, is basically a course in which um, we have hosted a number of guest lecturers from various different industries, usually on the C-suite or senior VP level, to, to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on the respective company and their industry and their, their future outlook. Um, some of these speakers have been absolutely phenomenal, um, and the course has gained quite a bit of popularity, and the industries that we've covered have been you know, fantastic as well, from pet care to athletics. We had a speaker from Formula One to microprocessors, um, PPE, hand soap, uh, biopharma, all of these different industries, and to see how their perspectives are in terms of, uh, you know, the, the hand soap company who's, who's seen an a, a, a influx in demand that they were expecting to see in five years and how they're coping with it in their supply chain to, um, you know, the, the pet care side that's having to have their stores shut down to see how they're coping with it. It's fascinating to actually understand it. So, um, for, for, you know, this particular presentation, I, I leveraged some of the learnings that came out of these classes. Uh, and one of these speakers, who is a phenomenal speaker, I've gotten his permission to uh, to put his details on this presentation, is Tom Lenton. He's the procurement chief procurement supply chain officer and a senior advisor at, uh, at Flex. His LinkedIn profile is here, as well as a link to his recorded talk in which he discusses many of the same issues that uh, that I've touched on here, uh, specifically with how he sees you know, the next phase of, of the world kind of looking after COVID-19. Um, as a uh, quick background of myself, my, my focus has been supply chain management data analytics for quite some time. I, I'm a computer science graduate and a PhD in supply chain. I've, I've worked at Rady for just a year now. It's been fantastic but before that, Harvard and USC, and I've got experience in industry at Procter & Gamble, as well as various other supply chain management consultancy. Um, I've worked in a number of different crises, although calling them crises now seems a little uh, of an overreaction. These are more just you know projects that have taken place from, from pet food recalls to uh, distribution center damages to natural disasters in terms of you know, hurricanes and these sets of things. Uh, and that's a little bit of background 
um, on myself. If there are any questions, I think now is the uh, is the allotted time. I think I've gone over by about five minutes. I'm sorry about that for for the presentation. But if there's any questions, please by all means feel free to ask away. And this screen here has my uh, my contact information. Should there be any follow up questions or any discussions that anyone would like to have going forward. Great, thank you, Zal. Um, we have some questions here. Let me first read the, the one, uh, the first one. Uh, what is the impact on the restaurant industry? Uh, for example, supplementation, uh, now, uh, supplementation announced that they are closing their business. So what do you think about the prospective of, of restaurant business? This is something that's been documented quite a bit, and it, it, it's um, it's interesting because the restaurant industry will have to change quite drastically. This is obvious um, from the purposes of, of sourcing, uh, you know, the, the materials, the, the the food, the ingredients, etc., 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 to the pr perspective of staff in the in the kitchen. But most of the attention has been put to people sitting in restaurants and what the social distancing is going to be. Um, it, it 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 seems that there will need to be somewhat of a of a screening process that's that's made not necessarily just for restaurants but for all retail for example if you have three cooks in a restaurant in the back are they going to be able to keep six feet from one another at all times while they're making the, the, you know, what, what's being ordered probably not are you going to have a situation in which waiters and waitresses are going to be able to keep that just probably not so there needs to be some sort of a screening process what i had read recently was um the the, the thought of there not being any walk-in clients anymore to restaurants Anybody can imagine that, but now you need to have a reservation, you need to come and you need to show some sort of a proof of a test or, or something like that. You're still going to be distanced, uh, so you're going to be removed from the next person beside you. And, and that is a way to potentially curb a little bit of the risk. Um, will the restaurant businesses flourish like they had once? Perhaps not in the interim, while everyone kind of gets used to the new way of, of, of doing business. Similar to 9-11, after the you know security measures were put in place, there was a little bit of a lull. Things needed a little bit of time to kind of get back up to speed. But inevitably, in one way, shape, or form, I, I can't see why the restaurant industry, in some way, won't come back. Great. Thank you, Zal. Another question we have is, um, are we seeing any of these changes implemented in the states that have reopened? Um, not quite. Um, we are seeing some uh, stages, some steps that have been taking place. It seems like a lot of what's taking place is now being politicized uh, in terms of, you know, which states are doing what. That, 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 with the reason for why I say that is because it seems like different states have different practices in terms of what the standards are. But there's not necessarily a, um, a blockade between people being able to go back and forth states. So it seems like uh, these, these regulations are, are state wide but not federal wide which means that in some states i believe you you have restrictions in california in which you you can't go to the beach other states are fine with it um, there have been attempts to re, you know relax restrictions but they've gone back up i think that was in florida um, certain areas you, you can go into a grocery store but there's only a certain amount of people that you have to have go in um, certain ones will require that you wear a mask so there are certain steps that are coming in but we haven't necessarily seen businesses open up fully, which means we haven't necessarily seen all the guidelines and restrictions come in full force. I expect that in time, we will. We have to. Great. Thank you again, Zal. The last question, we have many more, but uh, just because of the time, the last question sure. that I will read is a um, question about the electronics industry, specifically in the server market. Are we seeing any increase in the demand for servers? and server farms as a result of so many people working remotely? That's a great question. I don't know the data on that specifically. I do know that I have read some data in terms of the impact that working remotely has put on um, on, 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 on services like Zoom and, and uh, the security threats that have come up. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Zoom bombing, I think the term is. So a number of different areas that have come up in terms of discussion, in terms of threats, and in terms of precautions that people have taken. I don't know necessarily the data and what it suggests on the impact that uh, we're actually having on server forms, but this is a very legitimate question because it would be inevitable that we would be having more of an impact. Great, thank you Zal again. Um, we have actually other questions, but because of the time, um, I will uh, defer those questions. Let's say um, there is an address for Zal, so you can email him for those questions, and I hope that Zal will be able to answer those via email.
Um, with that, uh, thank you all for joining this webinar. And again, in this pandemic, stay well and safe. Thank you all. Thank you, Shin.